new grandstands, and lots more improvements here at the Bristol Motor Speedway. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on the Inside NASCAR. Of course, that's where we are. The Food City 500 NASCAR Winston Cup race scheduled to go off here this afternoon. Rusty Wallace will lead them off from the pole. They ran a bush race here yesterday, the Moore Snack 250. Stephanie Boyd is in our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina. She'll take a look back at that race, preview today's race, and bring us up to date on all the news. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Ned, and good morning, everyone. Well, once again, weather has played a part in a Winston Cup and Bush Grand National weekend. Rain wiped out second-round qualifying for the Cuppers on Saturday and delayed the start of yesterday's Bush Grand National race. But everything finally cleared out, and they're all set for today's Food City 500. We'll tell you all about it coming up, but first, here's a look at what else is ahead in this one hour of Inside NASCAR. After grabbing the Bush title in 95 and nearly repeating that feat last year, David Green made the jump to Winston Cup this season with hopes of taking home the Rookie of the Year honors as well. Stephanie Boyd will talk to David in the first of our three-part series with the 97 Cup newcomers. Like David Green, Tim Steele has made the jump from the Arca series he dominated for years to the Bush Grand National Series. Steele replaced Jeff Purvis in James Finch's Chevy at Las Vegas and has not looked back. We'll talk to the former Arca champ about his recent graduation. After three races on the Craftsman Truck Series schedule, 96 runner-up Jack Sprague finds himself sitting sixth in points heading to Phoenix next week. Sprague found victory lane both times in the desert last season and hopes to make it three in a row out west for the first of 97. We'll talk to the Hendrick truck driver. All this and more coming up on Inside NASCAR. Inside NASCAR is brought to you by Texaco Clean System 3 Gasoline and by Miller Lite, who reminds you that anything can happen at Miller time. After last weekend's inaugural race at the Texas Motor Speedway, the Winston Cuppers headed to Bristol, Tennessee this weekend for today's Food City 500. For a lot of the drivers, it was a long trip. Our Tyler Potter is in Bristol, where he tells us about that and has all the latest news from the track. Tyler? Thanks, Stephanie. On Thursday, the Kyle Petty Motorcycle Tour finished up in Kingsport, Tennessee. They left Fort Worth, Texas on Monday, stopping at six different cities along the way. All proceeds went to the area children's hospitals and the Winston Cup Racing Wives Auxiliary. The, the thing that stood out more for me is, is being able to, to go to uh, Jackson, Mississippi or to uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee and go into a hospital and give a money donation there. You know what I mean? Not only, you know, before we've sent money, we've sent checks, we've given it to the, I guess, the National Head Injury, uh, Make-A-Wish, Winston Cup Racing Wives. This was an opportunity for us to physically deliver the check and see where the money goes to. They're continuing to expand the Bristol Motor Speedway. 32,000 seats have been added between turns three and four, meaning 118,000 people will watch Sunday's Food City 500. By the fall, race capacity will rise to 130,000. Sunny skies greeted drivers Friday for round one qualifying. Last week's winner, Jeff Burton, was the fifth car out, setting the early mark with a time of 15.697 seconds. Twelve cars later, Rusty Wallace took over the top spot, covering the half-mile track at a speed of 123.586 miles per hour for a time of 15.526 seconds. It's Rusty's first pole in nearly three years and his third overall at the Bristol Motor Speedway. The other two coming in 91 and 93, both times he won the Food City 500. God, it feels good because the car is just really flying. It come off the truck running great, and the crew did a hell of a job. It's got a hell of a motor in it, too. Rusty's younger brother, Kenny, was fourth fastest in 15.583 seconds, hoping to build on last week's 13th place finish at Texas. The whole team has really turned the intensity level up, you know, and it's a situation where these next two races are good tracks for us. We expect to win. We expect to win here at Bristol or at Martinsville. And our biggest nemesis have been these intermediate tracks, and those have been our best finishes of the year, you know, like 13th at Dollars and 14th at Texas. So, uh, you know, we're, we paid our dues. It's our second year here, so we're ready to go. Sterling Marlin gave the home folks something to cheer about by securing the outside pole with a speed of 123.411 miles per hour. We didn't test here. Tested last year, and uh, yeah, we brought a different car, and this car brought just a plain old basic car and uh it run pretty good off the truck and run good all day and uh, got a real good lap in qualifying the guys have 
have been really working hard, the motor guys and chassis guys, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll get this thing turned around. Starting inside of Kenny Wallace on row two is the family channel forward of Ted Musgrave. Musgrave was knocked out of last week's race because of engine problems. That's, that's pretty impressive for me, you know, coming here to Bristol, which is a place that I kind of always fret on coming to, you know, and... But, you know, the car was really good right off the bat. We rolled it off the truck, and uh, I made about three, four laps, which were okay laps right off the bat. And I, I just pulled on the apron, made a lap real slow on the bottom, and said, man, I just got to get my bearings straight here. You know, this Bristol is different. Back up on the racetrack and right away started running, you know, like 15 nines and stuff. So uh, we didn't change a spring or a shock on the car. We changed the front sway bar, and that's about all we did. It was, I mean, it was right on right from the start. Rain was once again a problem, washing out second round qualifying Saturday. As a result, Michael Waltrip, Morgan Shepard, Dave Marcus, Daryl Waltrip, and Jack Sprague, who's driving the 25 car, all had to take provisionals. Those not making the field were Greg Sachs, Bobby Hillen, Billy Standridge, and Mike Wallace. For Wallace, it was especially frustrating after a season-best 17th place finish last week in the Interstate Batteries 500. Well, I think what's most frustrating is we had a fast enough car to make the race and we got loose qualifying, you know, and uh, took us out of a shot. And unfortunately, it seems like any time this rain affects qualifying, as soon as they announce they're not going to have qualifying, then the sun comes out and it clears up, and that's exactly what's happened here at Bristol. The Food City 500 is a milestone for two veteran drivers, Rusty Wallace and Bill Elliott. Wallace makes his 400th career start Sunday, Elliott his 500th. Well, I guess I've been pretty fortunate in my career. You know, I've been lucky enough that, you know, I've won some races, I've won a championship. Uh, I mean, even if my career ended tomorrow, it'd be a good, it, you know, I could look back and say, you know, we've done a lot of good things. Rusty Wallace starts on the pole for today's Food City 500. He's a six-time winner at Bristol with two of the victories coming from the pole. Sterling Marlin starts on the outside pole in his number four Kodak Chevy. Marlin's the hometown favorite with his shop in nearby Abingdon, Virginia. Row two features the Fords of Ted Musgrave and Kenny Wallace. Both drivers posted their best qualifying efforts of 97. Two-time defending Food City 500 champion Jeff Gordon starts on the inside of row three. Points leader Dale Jarrett holds down the outside. He started in the top ten in all seven races this season. A couple of Fords in row four, those of Hutch Strickland and Jeff Bodine. And rounding out the top ten are Steve Grissom and Jimmy Spencer. Grissom's coming off his first top ten finish of the year. He was tenth at Texas. Thanks, Tyler. Well, starting right behind Spencer in 11th for today's Winston Cup race is Jeff Burton, who claimed his first series win last week at Texas. And yesterday in the Morris Snacks 250, Burton continued his stellar run, claiming his first Bush Grand National win of the season. This week, we welcome Phil Wurz to our staff, and he has all the highlights. Among the Bush Grand National teams, the big news this week was the hiring of Butch Enders as crew chief for the number 99 Luxair Chevrolet team. You know, Enders comes to this team with a very impressive resume. It was crew chief for David Green's team that won the BGN title back in 1995. And he also hopes to do the same thing for 96 Ray Bestus Rookie of the Year, Glenn Allen. It's really great so far. Uh, we've come a long way in a short period of time, and uh, things are looking really good. How about coming over from the team you were with, uh, this Luxair team, what kind of potential they have? Fantastic. I think, uh, you know, with a little bit of time here, we're going to go a long way. As for Saturday's Moore's Snacks 250, steady rain greeted the drivers in the morning and continued well into the afternoon, delaying the start of the race for two hours. When the green flag finally waved, pole sitter Hermie Sadler in the DeWalt Chevrolet led the field of 42 cars into turn one. The Emporia Virginia native held onto the lead for the first 14 laps until Jeff Burton in the number nine track gear four took the lead. It wasn't until lap 30 that the first caution came out as Mike Dillon in the 72 car lost it in turn three on the world's fastest half mile, but he would return finishing 31st. Lap 50 provided the second caution when top 10 points man Mark Green took a wild ride down the front stretch in the Timberwolf Chevy, finally ending his day down in turn number one. The fifth caution came up at lap 105 as Bristol takes a bite out of Ron Barfield and others, including Tim Steele, Joe Bessie, and defending race champion Mark Martin. Martin lost the left rear tire of the Winn-Dixie Ford and lost a chance to make history. A win at Thunder Valley would have tied him with the most BGN victories all time with Jack Ingram. 
On lap 225, the seventh of the race's nine cautions proved costly for BGN points leader Todd Bodine. Seven cars sliding down the back stretch with Bodine, Greg Sachs, and Jeff Fuller's cars locked together at the end of the mess at the start of turn three. The incident cost Bodine a top 10 finish for the first time this season and his points lead. Red hot Jeff Burton led 139 laps, including the final 37. The last three run under caution after pole sitter Hermie Sadler's car caught fire in the pits after a cut tire ripped an oil line. For Burton, it was his first Grand National win since Myrtle Beach in 1993, right on the heels of his first Winston Cup win last week at Texas. Well, this is definitely momentum, and um, all you can do to keep rolling is just do the best you can do every week. It's, it's been real good the last week. Uh, whether we can continue to do this or not, we probably can't, but we can sure to continue to try to, you know, run in the front and put ourselves in position to win. That, that's what you got to do is just keep putting yourself in position. Well, that's all the time we have for this segment of Inside NASCAR. But when we come back, Ned will rejoin you from the shops of Winston Cup rookie David Green. The Food City 500 gets underway at 1 o'clock Eastern this afternoon. And as we leave you for this break, here's a look at the remainder of the starting lineup. We're in Charlotte, North Carolina at American Equipment Racing, owned by Buzz McCall. They're building a brand new facility to house these Caterpillar Chevrolets, which are driven by David Green in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. David is the former champion of the NASCAR Bush Series. We're going to have stories on all three of the contenders that are running for Rookie of the Year in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. And this week is our first, and it is on David Green. Stephanie Boyd has the story. In a matter of three months, David Green went from contending for the Bush Grand National Championship to having a yellow rookie stripe splashed across his bumper. In his first full season of Winston Cup, Green is finding things are a lot different in NASCAR's top division. In Bush Grand National, Green was the 1994 series champion, finished second in points in 1996, and was third in 1993. He has five career wins in that division and 1.5 million in earnings. But since moving to Winston Cup, the Caterpillar driver has missed two of the six races run so far. He failed to qualify for the season opener in Daytona, and last week, because of a late postmark, failed to make it into the inaugural race at the Texas Motor Speedway when qualifying was rained out. Once we left Daytona and failed to make that show, which was a big, big letdown for me as a driver, uh, you know, I, I wanted to to keep my record clean after that. And I was go out there and make each one of these races. And so far uh, up to Texas, we had made a uh, first round qualifying each week. And, and I thought really did a good job. But uh, on the good side of Texas was, you know, it was nobody's fault. It wasn't, it wasn't the engine builder's fault. It wasn't the crew chief's fault. It was none of the guy's fault. And maybe it wasn't even the driver's fault. We wasn't in that show. So just something freak that happened. And so we can digest it just a little bit easier. Green says he's not surprised by the tough breaks you can suffer moving from Bush to Winston Cup. After all, he won the BGN title while driving for Bobby Labonte, another driver who made the step up. Same scenario as last year in Bush, he, he finished second to the points and Joe, to Joe Nemechek. And to go over with Bill Davis and learn, 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 and thinking there was never going to be a day that he would run in the top five again, never be a day that he would be in the top five in points, and look what's happened, you know, he's, he's having an awesome year and he's going to be a contender, so I know it's right around the corner. Green says after being at the top of his game in Bush, it's been hard to take a back seat in the Cup Series. He says the intensity level is so much greater now, but that every little knock is well worth it. Yeah, it can be a lot more fun racing Bush, but, you know, all of our goals are, are to reach, keep reaching for the sky. You know, once you win one race or win one pole, you want to win two. And once you win one championship, you want to win two. So, um, and after you succeeded at, at the level you're at, my goal was to go on and move to the next step, where well, the next step was Winston Cup. And, and um, I'm just happy to be here. And yes, it is tough. And I feel like that if I can withstand the pressures, this team can withstand the pressures, the sponsor and the owner, that we will make our mark and be a part of the, uh, 
of the team, so to speak, and that's Winston Cup race team. So um, I wouldn't trade all this intensity and all these bad times for the very best days in Bush Grand National. And I don't mean that bad for the Bush Series. It's the perfect stepping stone. But these times are, are I think, well-deserved because you are at the top, and we all knew it was going to be tough. And making things even tougher is the fact that the two other rookie challengers have each already scored a Bush Pole Award. Mike Skinner claimed the pole at Daytona, while Robbie Gordon started first at Atlanta. Green was the master of poles in the Bush Grand National Division, claiming 18 in his five-year career, including nine in the 1994 season. But so far this year, he's the only rookie yet to set fast time. Well, there's a little more pressure now because, you know, everything I read and everything I heard was, you know, oh, David Green, he's going to be the guy that's going to make all those races, and Robbie Gordon's going to struggle, and Mike Skinner's going to struggle. Well, that was a bunch of bull, and I knew that from the start. Those guys are excellent race car drivers, excellent race teams, and their day was going to happen, and it's already happened. But, you know, we're going to have a shot in one of these races this year, and um, you know, I've got total confidence in that. This is a tough rookie crop, and again, I feel like that, that being second best or third best or even the winner of this rookie battle, it's going to be far better than other years in rookie battles when maybe the competition wasn't quite as stiff. And I know Johnny Benson would agree that he wished there was somebody out there that he could race against uh, for rookie of the year. Um, so anyway, I'm totally comfortable with this whole deal, but it's off to a little bit of a tough start, but we're going to rebound. Rebounding to green doesn't mean anything unrealistic. Daytona and Texas aside, his goal is simple, to make the remainder of this year's races. At the end of the year, if I can sit there and say, hey, you know, we made those races, the driver didn't mess up any of those times, and he qualified for those races, I'll be happy. I really will. Um, I know on Sundays, our performance hasn't been that good to my standards. Because when I get out there, like at Darlington and Rockingham, we had good qualifying efforts. We get out there, and I'm learning so much every lap how much different these cup cars are. But the main thing is I'm learning it, and the guys, the other competitors, are, are making me feel a part of that group. And um, I'm just building my um, library up full of information. So, you know, at the end of the year, it's not going to be fair to say, okay, if I won Rookie of the Year, that makes a successful season because uh, I can still say it's a success no matter where I finish in that rookie battle. And that's the main goal. This is Jeff Hammond, Crew Chief of Parts America Chevrolet. Today the subject is going to be brakes. As we move into the short track part of the year, brakes are very, very critical. As you can see, we have a huge brake here, the monster brake that we run on the short tracks compared to what we would like to run at Texas or Dover or Charlotte, for example. To be able to make these brakes live, you've got to have air. We spend a lot of money and a lot of time to make sure that these brakes are adequately cooled. If they're not kept cool, they will not last. If they don't last, you won't win. Special ducts are made and put in the nose of the car. Bigger brake pads special fluid, and a way to flow the air through the brakes with special ducts. As you'll see on the car out here in the back, all this package right here is what makes it, the brakes at Martinsville or any other short track live for the day. As you can see, we have specially made air ducts in the front nose of the car that allow air to be forced through the ducts you saw earlier, through the air hoses, past these electric fans that we also run to make sure that we have enough cooling during the slowdown or during the caution laps into the brake area, out through the wheel, keep the brakes cool during the course of the race. Also, I might add that some drivers have even found it necessary to put recirculators on their brake fluid to circulate the fluid when it does get hot to keep brakes during the course of the race. So next time you go to a short track, you can always be mindful that you've got to have good brakes if you're going to win. Tim Steele has been the man to beat in the ARCA series for the last couple of years, but he's made a change recently in his career, and Tyler Potter has the story. After 11 years together, Bush driver Jeff Purvis and car owner James Finch have gone their separate ways. Then fast ARCA driver Tim Steele to fill in at last month's Las Vegas 300. Steele finished fifth. One week later, he was given the job full-time. James and I have been talking for 
for years on and off, you know, past few years. And um, I guess we were finally just able to put a deal together. It must, I guess it was the right time for, for him and for me to, you know, for me to move over here and run for him. And, you know, I wasn't expecting too much out of, uh, you know, if, if I got it, great. If not, you know, it's not like I was uh, without a ride. I still had, you know, my own team and, and we were able to, to still go racing either way. So it wasn't, it was a deal where, you know, if I got it, great. If not, we'll go on. Since the announcement, Steele has struggled going 37th, 25th, and 21st the last three races just a, a learning curve for me you know getting used to the different cars and different motors and uh you know it's a, a lot less horsepower than what i'm used to so you got to keep these cars pretty free and it's uh just a learning curve but i'd say you know the first time out of the box it was it was great and then uh just got to get used to to losing i guess you know or getting beat it's not as much getting beat as it is better competition big thing is, you know, on the Arca circuit, there's, uh, you know, eight or ten guys that you got to race for the win every week. And um, here there's, you know, 20 or 30 good cars here. And the tenth can be the difference between first and 20th. And that's the big difference. Everything is so close that, you know, there's a lot more, a lot more people to race against. Another adjustment for Steele has been going from being the sole owner to driver only. He still owns his ARCA team. Used to having my own team in total control, and and these guys are, you know, they're a really good bunch of guys to work with. Everybody's pretty easy going, and we seem to be going pretty good. I guess you'd say I'm more used to being in the shop and and working on a lot of the cars, but. Uh, you know, I live in Michigan and the team's in Florida and there's a lot of space in between Michigan and Florida. So I, I just see the guys in the car at when they get to the racetrack. Despite having crashed the last two weeks in Hickory and Texas, Steele remains upbeat for the rest of the season. We'd like to be able to win a race or two this year, you know, it's, uh, we're going to, I'm going to a lot of new tracks that, um, I'm not familiar with, but, uh, you know, there's also some tracks that we run that that I am familiar with. You know, with at Talladega, James has got an awesome car for the the restrictor plate races, and uh, you know, we're going to Michigan. I've ran there quite a bit, and, but a lot of it's just going to be a big learning curve on the new tracks. And you know, the goal is just to to finish the best that we can at all the give any given race. Steele's just one step away from fulfilling his dream of being a Winston Cup driver. And at 28, that appears to be not far off. Wanted to do it. You know, be here at Winston Cup before I turn 30 and still got a couple of years to go. So, so I guess I'm ahead of schedule there. Some other drivers are making changes in their careers too. Moving from the Goodish Dash Series to the NASCAR Bush Series. We'll have that story when we come back. My favorite country artist is, uh, is Don Cox because uh, not only is he a, uh, a good singer, but he's a friend of mine. We've been friends for, for a long time, and he uh, supports me in my racing, and I go watch him uh, when I can. And he's got a couple of records out and got another one coming out here pretty soon. And um, the biggest thing is we just, we just support each other, and um, I, like to, I like to listen to him sing, too. I've got a lot of great CDs and a lot of people I listen to, but, of course, Steve Warner would be my favorite. Uh, I've known him for a couple years now. I've met him through Michael Waltrip, and uh, he's just a down-to-earth guy. I just like listening to Randy Travis. It's kind of uh, just some of his songs and his lyrics, uh, you know, hit, hit home with me, and uh, I just enjoy listening to him. Nothing replaces experience if you're going to move up in the sport of auto racing. How do you get that experience? Some drivers have used go-karts as stepping stones. Some have used the stock cars on short tracks, while others have used the Goodies Dash series. Such is the case with Linda Namich and David Hutto. They're both past champions of the Goodies Dash Series, and now they're trying their hand in the NASCAR Bush Series. And Stephanie Boyd has their story. For many drivers, the Bush Grand National Series has served as a stepping stone to Winston Cup. Guys like Jeff Gordon, Jeff Burton, and Bobby Labonte are some of the most recent graduates. 
But for those guys trying to reach Bush Grand National, there may be a new division emerging as one of its major stepping stones. Jimmy Foster, Lyndon Amick, and David Hutto are all newcomers to Bush this year, and all three drivers cut their teeth in the NASCAR Goodies Dash Series. Basically, you run most of the short tracks in the Dash Series, but they prepared me for some super speedway events as far as like Homestead and Daytona, and I raced Bristol last year, so they helped me out quite a bit. I saw some of these tracks, but uh, plus it, in some advantage, it doesn't help you because, you know, you run a lot of these short tracks that, that you don't run, and uh, plus they have 13-inch tires and a smaller motor, not quite as much horsepower, so there's, there's a little difference there. Well, the biggest thing I'm having to adjust to is the size of the car and uh, the horsepower, but uh, it's a lot more competition in the series, and uh, we're getting, getting uh, with the deal and uh, running better now. How big of a transition was it for you to come out of that series into Bush Grand National? Well, it was the biggest ever. You know, it's the biggest of my career so far. With the tires and the motor and the weight of the car, it's a big difference from the Dash series. All three drivers are extremely young, and all three were also standouts while running in the Dash series. Foster is the oldest at a mere 20 years old. He was the 1996 Dash Rookie of the Year, and this year is driving the majority of the Bush races in the Speed Vision Outdoor Life Ford. He'd started six races heading into this weekend, compared to four for Amick and two for Hutto, knowing that this year is a time for learning. I expect to just get a lot of experience out of this. I'm not out there to try to set the world on fire or anything, but it's it'd be nice to, I mean, there's Steve Park, he's a rookie here, and he's, I mean, he's been done tremendously well out here. And I wish I could be in his shoes now, but, you know, I'm out there getting experience, and that's what I need to do is just gain a lot of experience out here. At 18, Amick became the youngest driver to ever win a stock car race at Daytona. He's also the youngest driver ever to win at both Daytona and Bristol. But after winning the Dash Series title last year, Amick, who's now 19, decided it was time to move up. Well, we're just running 20 races. We want to get in all the races, run all the laps, and just get experience for the next year. Because next year, is the, we want to be competitive and hopefully, you know, have some top fives or whatever we can do. But we just want to finish the races this year. Also 19, David Hutto became the youngest driver to ever win a touring division championship when he claimed the Dash Series title at 18 in 1995. He started racing in that series when he was only 16 and is now competing in one of NASCAR's top divisions. Well, you know, I just graduated high school, and it's, uh, they say it's not as tough when you're young, but I don't know about that, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm young, got a long time to learn, so, uh, we're just making an adjustment right now and, uh, make it short as possible. We're gonna try to run 10 races this year if everything works out all right, and, uh, and, uh, we might run more if we, uh, pick up some sponsorship, but the way it is now, we're gonna run 10 races and, uh, maybe the full schedule next year. The competition level in the Bush Series is definitely stiff, and it keeps growing every year. But these drivers say the Dash Series is a great proving ground and has helped prepare them to compete with some of the best in the business. We really did. We uh, went track to track and run some of the Bush tracks and Winston Cup tracks, so it really helped me a lot. And uh, similar cars, but not exactly alike. So um, it really did. It's a good series to get started in. And uh, we also ran some All-Pro, and that helped too. But uh, the Dash Series really did help. I guess as much as it could have, you know, it's kind of hard to get go through anything to get prepared for Bush Grand National because it's so tough. But I think we took the right steps in order for me to advance my career in the Bush Series. And, you know, it, just trying to learn the cars and everything. What do you think the Dash Series taught you that's been most valuable to you in the Bush Series? Patience. I mean, it's... I'm used to running 20 lap races, and with the Dash Series, we ran 150, 125, and it was just... To help me use patience. I had to learn to save the tires and save the car. And with the stuff I'm used to running, you usually don't have to do that. You go out there and go wide open for 15, 20 laps and you were done. So it's it's helped me out quite a bit for patience. Being patient. I mean, in the dash series, you had to be patient because, you know, the laps were less, but you had a long time to run in the cars, considering. And then just to be patient, you know, before you run, like if somebody ran late miles, you run 20 lap features. Well, you know, 100 laps, 200 laps, you just got to really be patient in those races. All three of the newcomers say since entering Bush Grand National, they often bounce things off each other since they're pretty much all in the same boat. So of all the drivers who have graduated to the Bush ranks, it seems these guys are still in a class by themselves. Thanks, Stephanie. Coming up next, the mailbox right after this break. We also have a story on Jack Sprague, so you stay with us.
King from Arnold, Maryland. Flower cars sometimes pushed and sometimes driven onto the track during practice. Hi, I'm Steve Flattenberg, crew chief for ST Motorsports driver Jeff Fuller, Sunoco Chevrolet. Uh, most of the time in practice, we drive the cars onto the racetrack. Sometimes when you see us pushing them around in the pits, we're lining them up for qualifying or just to get in line for the first start. And that way we try to keep the motors cool so that the, the engine doesn't run hot during practice. If you race cars deserve a medal every week for the hours and service that they put in, I'd like to inject something personally here, if I may. Lenore Ryan College in Hickory, North Carolina, is bestowing an honor upon me, giving me a Doctorate of Humanity Service. That'll be coming up on May the 10th, something I really appreciate the Board of Trustees for this honor. We'll be back with a story on Jack Sprague right after this. Pillar Chevrolet that David Green plans to run in the Goodies 500 next weekend at Martinsville, Virginia. We have a new guy on our staff, Phil Wurz. We'd like to welcome him aboard. He has a story on Jack Sprague, who runs the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. For some, Myrtle Beach's Grand Strand is a great place to relax. But for the driver of the Quaker State Chevrolet, Jack Sprague, a recent trip to the Myrtle Beach Speedway was for R&R. &R. Research and more research on a short track, the kind of tracks where the 32-year-old from Michigan has yet to claim a victory. We don't get to test that much because, number one, we can't test on racetracks that we race on. We only get five manufacturer tests a year. Basically, just, you know, our short track program, if we can get it to where our speedway program is, then we'll just be that much stronger. Sprague is already strong on the super speedway. All five of his truck wins in 47 career starts came in 96, and all five on tracks of one mile or more including both wins at Phoenix International Raceway last season. And for One Mile Jack, four of those wins came in two separate back-to-back -back checkers, including the last pair of the season to overtake 95 champion Mike Skinner for second place in the final point standings. But so far, 97 has not been so kind for Sprague. In the season opener in Orlando, he had the pole and led 177 of 200 laps only to lose the lead and the race on the final lap to Joe Rutman in a turn one bumping battle. He finished 15th. Add to that seventh and fifth place finishes in the last two races, and Sprague sits sixth in the points, but he knows the Rick Hendrick-owned team deserves better. Our finishes don't really reflect the way we've ran this year. We could have very easily been sitting here with two wins under our belt, you know, four out of the last five races we've ran, but we're sitting here with none. and. Uh, it doesn't bother anybody worse than it bothers me. Uh, the 15th place finish Orlando put us way back, and we had to dig farther. We had to dig forward from there. We're only 48 points out of the lead in sixth place. And like I said, there's some trucks up there that uh, that I don't feel will stay there. And Sprague now exudes a certain confidence he lacked just a few years ago. As a Bush Grand National driver, he made 70 starts. His best finish was second in '92. Then in 94, he went back to driving late models where he was able to find victory lane once again. Then in 95, Hendrick Motorsports found Sprague and was able to rejuvenate his career and confidence on the truck circuit. Truck deal started and I just had an opportunity to do it in the 31 truck and uh, figured why not, you know? And luckily I did because, you know, two thirds through the year there, it, that deal went away and it gave me the opportunity to get get the deal with, you know, Rick Hendrick and Hendrick Motorsports and it's a great series. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's bearing in the Bush series, but it's taken a lot of uh, focus off of maybe and, you know, a lot of the, the truck series drivers are getting a lot of good opportunities to run Winston Cup. and. Uh, you know, they're, they're probably closer to a Winston Cup car. Other than the body, they're, they're about the same. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a great series. It's a great uh, step in that direction. And, you know, they, when the Winston Cup guys come to these races, they don't beat us very often. And uh, I think that proves how good the series is and how good the drivers in the series are. That's why Sprague has visited Myrtle Beach Speedway hoping to hone his short track skills for the three races after Phoenix, a trio of less than one mile tracks at Portland, Oregon, Monroe, Washington, and Odessa, Missouri, where Sprague could make a serious push for the points lead. But Fords have won two of the first three races in 97,
Frank says Chevy drivers will have their work cut out for them this year, in keeping a Ford driver from winning their first truck title. While One Mile Jack has his sights set on winning a truck championship for the Quaker State Chevrolet in 97, he's also going to get a chance to drive this weekend in the Food City 500 Winston Cup race in Bristol. He'll be subbing for a fellow Hendrick teammate, the injured Ricky Craven in the number 25 Budweiser Chevrolet. And he has hopes of getting a permanent Winston Cup ride further down the road. You know, this has been a great series for me. It's, it's saved my career, you know, Hendrick Motorsports along just as much a part of it as, as the Super Truck series. And, uh, if any way possible, I want to do it right here. That's, that's my goal. And of course, I can't wait till I'm 50, but you know, that's what I want to do, and, and that's what I want to do real soon. The all-time winningest driver at the Bristol Motor Speedway is Darrell Waltrip with 12 victories, including a seven-race winning streak from April 1981 through April of 1984. Here's what he had to say in 1983. I said a couple of years ago, follow me in Tennessee. I was just kidding at the time, but it, uh, it sure was nice tonight. Our car just performed extraordinarily well, and it was a good race. Uh, Bobby kept the pressure on us most of the way, and uh, we were able to open up a little lead right at the end. But, uh, you know, it, it's fun racing like that. It's fun to have somebody behind you. It was a short race to me, 500 laps. When you got somebody in your mirror, they take the back, you take the front, and it, it's a lot more fun that way. In 1985, Dale Earnhardt swept Bristol, winning both the Valley Dale Meets 500 and the Bush 500. Came down to the last caution, and we, uh, you know, changed left side. Ricky changed right, and I, I think that's what won us the race. I don't really think uh, we could have beat him if we had run on to the end. I don't really think I could have beat him. I had a, had a, a mismatched set of tires on the car, and the car wasn't handling that good. And, you know, luckily we uh, got that caution, changed tires, and uh, come back and beat him. I had a good. Good stop. Uh, even though we didn't beat him out, we come out just the same time as he did. So we worked off hard all day, and it, you know it paid off. And at Bristol on April the 6th, 1986, Rusty Wallace took his very first career Winston Cup victory. It's magnificent. You know, it was a dream of a lifetime. Like I said earlier, I just wish my wife Patty was here to share it with me. But she's been to every race. She decided to stay home. This one here because her mother and father are in town. But I tell you, that Blue Max team, Al Yard sponsored race car is a number one in my book, and they did one great job in the pits and on the track for me to bring this thing in victory lane. Darrell Waltrip, Del Earnhardt, and Rusty Wallace, three of the 27 drivers who have made it to victory lane at the Bristol Motor Speedway since 1961. It's two short track races in a row for the NASCAR Winston Cup drivers this weekend at Bristol, Tennessee, and next weekend at Martinsville, Virginia. There are a lot of you race fans out there that would like an opportunity to get in one of these NASCAR Winston Cup cars, get behind the wheel. Well, maybe the closest thing to that is a racing simulator, and boy, has the technology in that improved. That is the subject of this week's Inside NASCAR Profile. Concord, North Carolina's Scott Davis and Steve Mirabelli have developed and patented the first interactive, motion-based, full-size stock car simulator. And soon, it could give race fans a chance to see and feel what it's like to drive an authentic NASCAR race car. Well, Scott gave me a call uh, a couple of years ago and wanted to do something like this, but more along the idea of an interactive video. Now, the technology is not quite there yet for interactive video. And... Um, we developed the idea out, and the Papyrus software arrived on the scene just in time to sort of rescue the whole idea, and we've been developing the idea ever since, and uh, this is the finished product. Racing Simulator Concepts uses an actual Chevy Monte Carlo. That's the hardware. A company called Papyrus out of Boston developed the software called NASCAR 2, which includes replications of just about every NASCAR track. Well, uh, we've had uh, a, a number of people who've actually driven Charlotte, uh, some uh, uh, drivers that have driven the Sportsman Series and so forth, so they have a real feel for the track, and they say that it's, uh, it's a pretty neat deal. They, they, uh, they say it's real close to what they experience out there. Uh, obviously, you can't simulate the G-forces, but everything else is right on the mark. The simulator's actual movement provides a lot of the authenticity. Air pistons move the stock car in different directions, depending on if you're accelerating, braking, or turning to either side. Later models will use hydraulic pistons to decrease excessive noise. 
and the six speakers providing surround sound give the driver another sense of realism. It takes about six to eight weeks to build one of these simulators at a cost of $60,000. Not exactly for home use yet, but corporate sponsors could easily provide a display for fans at upcoming NASCAR events through a marketing group called Sponsorship Services Group. Well, sky's the limit for NASCAR in general, and um, this is just a small part of it, and we'll just have to try the first one and see where it goes from there. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for this show. We hope you enjoyed it, and our thanks to all the folks here at the Caterpillar Racing Team for allowing us to show you around their shops. You join us again here on TNN for more on Inside NASCAR.